And after speaking on the subject, thy kingdom come. I have composed what I thought were some rather clever introductory remarks which in this atmosphere have become inappropriate. I sense the presence of God in this final meeting in a confirmatory way that serves to underline what I felt all week, that we have been in the presence of the living Word of God, that we have not only been ministered to out of the hearts and minds of gifted men, but we've been ministered to on a high level, which marks those times of special direction that God wants to give to his people when he lifts us into a special dimension of awareness and insight. Earlier this week, Charles was referring to the brothers that are related, and he spoke of the distinctive characteristics of the brethren. He made reference to an inside joke among them. He said that one of the brothers is always referring to things in the larger perspective. I'm the brother. It was interesting that in his introduction tonight, he incorporated that same phrase. In speaking to you about thy kingdom come, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to try on this last night to put in the larger perspective what God is doing, the meaning of the practice that you heard from experienced and dedicated men, the very practical remarks of John Poole and Larry Christensen, the things that the other brothers have said that have spoken to our practical needs. I appreciated them, I have fed upon them, but I, I feel that to inspire our hearts even to undertake those practical matters, our faith must be charged and sustained by understanding that we are part of a cosmic scheme inaugurated by God and intended by God to be carried out until the entire universe acknowledges that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God has a problem in communicating with us. The problem is to communicate his infinite mind to our finite understanding. Therefore he gathers up all of our human relationships and uses them to transmit some understanding of an aspect of his own character. Therefore when we speak of king or kingdom God makes use of that to give us understanding of his authority. I like Dr. Moffat's translation of the kingdom of God. He speaks of it as the reign of God. God reigns. It's the manifest authority of an infinitely holy and loving God. It's this authority coming into a time-space world and bringing man into a willing obedience to the order of God. Using the metaphor of a king, the word of God indicates that God has always been absolute sovereign, 
There's never been a time when God was not in total charge. The Bible tries to tell us in simple language of the ultimacy of God. There is none before him. There is none beside him. He takes orders from none. He was created by none. He is life self-existent. There is nothing in him that should be out of him. Nothing out of him that should be in him. He remembers nothing because he's forgotten nothing. He learns nothing because there is nothing he does not know. He does not need to recall because he holds all truth simultaneously. He is the God of the eternal now. He can look at human history from the beginning or the end or the middle, for all things are known to him. The Bible tells us that the Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. And the margin says, all means the universe. God is the king of the cosmos. Psalm 29.10 says, the Lord sat as king at the flood. Yes, the Lord sits as king forever, or as one translation says, over the ages. He is the God who out of his eternal nowness spun the time-space world into existence. He sits outside of it in powerful authority, and he is involved within it in incarnate humility. He is the cosmic king. It is of the nature of our God that within the mystery of the plurality of his own person, there is order. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or as an old Puritan divine has said, God in himself is a sweet society. The order of God's ultimate purpose is to be seen in his own person, that within the mystery of his person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is absolute unity while there is inexplicable submission. The Father sent the Son, and the Son came. The Son returned to the Father, and the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit came. And within the persons that are co-equal, co-substantial, and co-essential, there is a submission that is evident, that is the highest lesson to us, that God is a God of order, and as Bishop Hooker has said, order is heaven's first law. And in the kingdom coming, we are not speaking of some euphoric, ethereal, mystic matter. We're talking of order. We're talking of man coming in to the fullness of his self-realization, into his ultimate destiny as the image of God functioning in interpersonal relationships and in community until a waiting universe sees God projecting himself out of the trinity of his persons into a community of redeemed men and women that are to the everlasting praise of his glory. <laughs> that mysterious creation, the angels are marked by order. We read of seraphim and cherubim, archangels. We read of God sustaining that order. When we read of the covering cherub, Lucifer, who probably was the one whom now we call Satan, who at one time was the top cherub in the hierarchy of the angelic order, who rose up in rebellion against God and was cast from his high place, we are reminded again and again that within the order of God in a pre-Adamic situation in the heavenlies, God could mete out punishment and judgment and maintain order. And the God who maintained order in the angelic species is the God who is establishing and will bring ultimate order in the redeemed community. In the world of men, he established his first man, Adam, and gave him rule and authority over the earth. He made him a ruler, and Adam became the first delegated human authority in the earth. 
Satan himself, having been thrust out of a place of authority, moved in on God's creation and subtly moved into the human situation of Adam and Eve, and Adam yielded to the sinister and subtle seduction of Satan and abdicated in favor of what he considered to be a better offer, his independence. Satan's lie to the first man was that if he would move out from under the divine order, that he would find himself in a most enviable position, he would be equal to God, he would be able to spin his own worlds off the end of his creative fingertips, he would be able to have his own angelic order, he would be like God, God was holding out on him. Real life did not lie in submission to God, real life lay in coming out from under that submission and establishing an independent posture and doing his own thing, and so sin has its initial definition. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, but the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Turned every one to his own way. But that is never quite true. For as Satan seduced Adam and Eve and brought them out from under the authority of God and God's order, they thought they were coming out to a position of independence where they would be equal with God. But rather they came out only to be dominated by the one who had seduced and drawn them away from God. The Bible tells us that every man who is not under divine authority tonight is not only doing his own thing, but he has adequate and able assistance from demonic powers. For Paul, writing to the Ephesians, said, And you hath he quickened, who are dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now energizes the children of disobedience. Disobedience means that a man has come out from under divine order to do his own thing. And to come out from divine order is to automatically put one under the deceptive influence of Satan himself. <laughs> Satan's initial lie was followed, followed by a series of lies, for our Lord said he was a liar from the beginning. His continuing lie was a bluff that he started and continues to impose upon many men, Christians included. And that was that when, abdicated, when Adam abdicated his authority, that Satan took it over. That when Adam fell, that Satan got the authority over the earth. And he has pulled this lie on generation after generation of men. And there are Christians tonight who consider Satan to be equal with God and that there's some kind of a titanic struggle going on, the issue of which is not yet sure. This is not the case. When Adam abdicated authority, Satan didn't get it. God reached down and took the scroll of authority out of Adam's hand and he said, I'll keep it until one comes who can handle it. I suggest that we all memorize and quote as we rise each morning, Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all that dwell therein. Satan has been trying to bluff men into believing that when Adam abdicated authority that God gave it to him, God didn't give it to him. You reply, but he is referred to as the God of the world, the Prince of the world. Indeed he is, but as we've already been told in this convention, we must learn to define our terms of reference. I'm in the world, and he's not my God nor my Prince, nor is he your God or your Prince. Therefore we must find out what world he is, Prince over and God over. He is Prince and God over the world of moral intelligences that are willingly submitted to his lying reign. He is not king of my world. He's not God of my world. For I am in a world that belongs to the Lord. I'm in a world that he is, that God is sovereign over. I'm in a world that has always belonged to God, always will belong to God, and which one day will be regenerated and refurbished to become the eternal dwelling place of a community of men and women who have been prepared to manifest God's glory in a world which is designed for righteousness.
You say if God retrieved order, if God retrie retrieved authority when Adam abdicated, how then did he handle it? The word of God is clear in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, that God who at sundry times and in divers manners and times past spake unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. God undertook from the time of Adam's abdication to speak to men through prophetic voices. He reigned from heaven. And if you'll read carefully the Old Testament scriptures, you'll find that he spoke through prophetic voices. A prophet is one who speaks for another. Satan thought he had the authority, but God had it all the time. Spoke his authority through prophets. Prophets anointed kings. Prophets declared the will of God. Prophets in the earth were inspired to mediate God's divine authority. They did that for the thousands of years until God's ultimate prophet came upon the scene. God's final voice, God's ultimate manifestation, God's own darling son whom he plucked from his bosom and into whom he poured all the riches of his wisdom and grace and who came for us men and for our salvation to become God's final voice, to become the pattern son, to become the ideal man after which he would pattern a whole community of redeemed ones, God chose to speak through prophets until he came whose right it was to reign. There are three significant men in the Old Testament to which we relate, Adam, Abraham, and David. We relate to Adam racially, we relate to Abraham redemptively, and we relate to David royally. It's an interesting thing that in the genealogies of our Lord in Luke and Matthew, that in Luke our Lord is spoken of as the son of Adam, and in Matthew, verse 1 of chapter 1, he is referred to as the son of David and the son of Abraham. Therefore our Lord is traced back to these three men. We all know what it means that he is the son of Adam, and we know what it means that he is the son of Abraham. But I'm wondering if we are only coming to know what it means that he is the son of David. It is also interesting that all of the birth references in the gospel to our Lord coming into the world in miraculous incarnation relate him with David. I search in vain for any announcement of him in relationship either to Adam or Abraham. He is related to David because David stands in the Old Testament scriptures in terms of the ultimate purpose of Mashiach in the finalization of God's redemptive purpose. And I'm wondering if what is happening to us now, as God is calling us to corporiety and community, if we are not realizing that for years we have attracted men to the Jesus Christ who is the seed of Abraham, when Paul is writing his epistle to the Romans, where he is giving us a treatise on the nature of salvation. When he wants to speak of personal salvation, he refers us to Abraham. But when he's addressing the Corinthians, where he's talking about the corporate community life, he addresses us rather to David and to the corporate body of the Old Testament community. In Abraham we have individual salvation, but in the nation we have corporate salvation, and the corporate salvation of the nation is represented by God's king after his own heart, King David. In Matthew chapter 16, our Lord made the announcement of his purpose. He said, Who do men say that I am? They said, Some say you're this one and some say you're that one, but he said, Who do you say that I am? Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, said our Lord, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. He said, I give unto you the keys of the kingdom. I will build my church. I give unto you the keys of the kingdom. Now when he said, I will build my church, I think the emphasis is on my. The word church is an interesting word. It's the Greek word ekklesia. And both to a Greek and a Hebrew, it would have significant meaning. To the Hebrew, it is that word that is used in Greek to translate the Hebrew word congregation, used over 70 times in the Septuagint version. Therefore, what he was saying to the Hebrew was, I will build my congregation. I will build my con. How does my be distinguished from somebody else's? Who had a congregation in the Old Testament? Moses. 
And so in the book of Hebrews we're told that Moses was faithful as servant in the Lord's house, but Christ is son over the house. It's also interesting in the book of Revelation that they sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Now what was Jesus saying? He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail it against it. He said, Moses had his church. He brought his church through the wilderness, but he couldn't take his church in. And when eventually his church did go in, they still couldn't make it. They were to be the theocratic national evangelistic center of the world. They were to establish a theocracy at the heart of the earth that would become the voice of God throughout all the nations. Psalm 48 said it was to be the joy of the whole earth. But division and dissension broke it up and it dwindled away until with the coming of Christ he had to look at what was left of the congregation of Moses and say to them, Your house is left unto you desolate and the kingdom is taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. He said, Now I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. The gates of hell prevailed against Moses' church, but not against my church. My church is going to be a successful church. I declare it, I affirm it, I determine it. My church will be a successful church. For years we have interpreted this negatively. We said, I'm in the church and thank God the devil can't get at me. The gates of hell cannot prevail. And so we huddle together feeling that we're protected by that word of the Lord. I think that's not what he meant primarily. I have not ever been attacked by a gate. I've never had a gate jump off its hinges and chase me down the street. But on more than one occasion, I've had some difficulty in opening a gate. There have been many times when I couldn't get the thing to open. What is our Lord saying? He's saying, I am God's ultimate purpose. There is nothing beyond me. There's nothing after me. I have come to do God's ultimate thing. I will build a congregation that will succeed. They'll kick the gates of hell in. They'll frustrate Satan's plans. They'll break up his finest, most sophisticated schemes. I am going to have a congregation that will not fail as did Moses. I am going to have a people who will come under the reign of my father and who will become indeed a theocratic community in the earth that will attract the attention of all men who will be forced to declare that the sending of Jesus Christ Christ in the purpose of God was the ultimate answer to earth's need in an alternate society, in a counterculture, in a community of men and women who have got it together and can manifest the life of the Trinity and the community of heaven in a time-space world. When he came into the world in the humiliation of the Incarnation, he started on a route of conquest that took him through the lonely years until the time that he was introduced in the muddy waters of Jordan as the bony prophet-like finger of John the Baptist was pointed at him. And those significant words were uttered, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. For some thirty-three and a half years, he overcame and lived an impeccable life so that it can be said of him that he was tempted in all points like as we, yet without sin. His impeccable life was followed by a decisive death as he went to Calvary to endure inexplicable and incomparable suffering, sufferings that we can only have a hint of, sufferings that we can only look at curiously and sometimes with a sob in our throat, sufferings that are veiled in the mystery of the bearing of sin, sufferings that are surrounded by torn rocks and a sun that refuses to shine and a nurse that rises in an agony as he hangs there alone and God reaches down his giant fist and gathers the accumulated sins of men and places it upon him and he becomes the sin center of the universe so that it could be said of him he was made sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him in the awful loneliness of Calvary he made his soul an offering for sin and the sin of the world was placed upon him and the bolts of God's wrath were released upon him and he became an offering for sin 
that. And he gave up the ghost, and he came down from the mystery of his suffering, having finished the work. What men saw was a man hanging limp, every bone out of joint, a swollen tongue protruding from burning lips. As he cried out, it is finished. They didn't know what was going on. But the veil of revelation is drawn back and we're told by Paul that something was going on in the darkness of that awful hour. He was tying a chain around the neck of the demonic world. He was dragging them across the stage of the cosmos. And the Bible said that he was destroying principalities and powers and making a show of them openly, triumphing over them in his cross. He was dealing with sin. He was dealing with the old Adamic society. He was making an end of an old order. And when he had done it in the mystery of his cross, he said, it is finished. And then he went down to make his announcement. The Bible says, or the creed says, rather, he descended into hell. Or Hades. I'm not going to take time to document all of these things or enter into argument about them. But I believe that he went down and, through the authority of what he had just accomplished at Calvary, he confronted his satanic majesty as he stood at the portals of the world of Hades. And he said to him, I'll take the keys. Satan says, I've been waiting for you for about 4,000 years. He said, I was there in the Garden of Eden. I was the one that got that rap. I was the one that was told that somebody was going to come along and crush my head. And I've been waiting for you. And I've been killing people off all along the historical line because I thought they were the ones. But here you are. Now in there with the rest of them. They're all in there. Who was in there? Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Isaiah and Malachi, they were all in paradise. In fact, just before our Lord had gone to his cross, they come up on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elias, and they had a conversation. They talked to the Lord, and the Bible tells us what they talked about. They spake of his decease that was soon to be accomplished in Jerusalem, and they said, everybody's excited down in paradise. There's great excitement down there, Mashiach. We, we want to tell you that we, we've been appointed a committee to come up and tell you that, that, that everything's all, everything's all a stir down there. Man, when we left, Isaiah wanted to come. He said that this is the greatest day. I wrote about this, and, and, and now it's coming to pass. He said, Abraham, he was right behind. He, he, he wanted to come too, but we were appointed to come and tell you that we're so grateful for what you're doing. There are thousands of them down there. Everything's all a fair. Why? Because under the old covenant, the blood of bulls and of goats couldn't take away sin. There were men down in paradise clenching in their fists their credit notes, for they were down there with promissory notes. Every time an Israelite laid his hands on a lamb and transmitted his sins, that that lamb may die in his place, that at best was a credit note to be redeemed by the most precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they were waiting for the time when their credit notes would be redeemed, and now this is the time. And so he comes down from his cross and he confronts his satanic majesty, and he says, I'll take those keys. And Satan said, no one's ever talked to me like this. And Jesus said, no one ever had the authority to. But he said, as God's king, as the one who has now been given authority as his delegated sovereign, I'm in charge now. I'll take the keys. And Satan handed him the key. And he went over into the unrighteous section. And he opened the door and he looked in and he had pronounced that they had been righteously judged for having rejected God's counsel under an old economy, and he shut the door and left them there. And then he turned to the gate of paradise, and he opened it, and he said, Come on, let's go. <laughs> they started up the steps of ascension, and when they got as far as Jerusalem, some of those Old Testament saints said, Master, do you mind if we have a stopover ticket? We'd like to spend a few hours in the old hometown. We haven't seen it for centuries.
And the Bible says that the bodies of many of the saints were seen in the streets of Jerusalem. Having looked at the old hometown, they continued with their journey. And up and up and up they went until they came in sight of the ramparts of glory. And then this great crowd of Old Testament redeemed who are moving paradise into better quarters cried out, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. But it's not that easy, for angelic protectors hurl back their challenge over the ramparts of glory, and they say, Who is this King of glory? They said, Let's tell him. He is the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. the one who has just come freshly from the battlefields of Golgotha, where single-handedly he dealt a death blow to all of Satan's plans and purposes, where single-handedly he bore the sins of men, where single-handedly he cut off the old Adamic order, where single-handedly he died a defice of death, meeting the demands of God, meeting the requirements of man. He is the Lord of hosts, mighty in battle. Now will you lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. And again, unsatisfied, they reply, Who is this King of glory? And they cry back, He he is the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. He is the one who is in charge of all the angelic hosts. But not only that, he is the king now of a multitude which no man can number. He is God's delegated authority. He is the one who is to bring to God the fruit of his purposes. He is the King of glory. Now swing back those gates and let the King of glory come in. And the gates swing back and he enters in, steps up to the Father's throne, presents the tokens of his redemption, and the Father's and sit down, son, at my right hand and reign until thine enemies are made thy footstool. to enter into eschatological debate tonight. I want simply to affirm my faith. And I want to affirm my faith in what I believe the Word of God teaches with all due deference to what you may think. And I don't mean that offensively. But I believe that when he sat down at the right hand of God, the Father meant what he said. He said, sit on my right hand until, and that's a time word. And I don't think he's going to get away from the right hand of God until. If he's going to sit there until, he's going to sit there until. And he's going to sit there until he's done it from there. He's not going to come and do it from anywhere else. He's going to do it from there. And when he's got it done, then will he turn the kingdom over to the Father. But not until he's done the job that he's supposed to do. The father said, sit here, son, and you sit here until you finish the job and then hand it to me, finish. You sit here and rule and reign until your enemies are made your footstool. Paul picks it up and weaves it into the New Testament revelation when he says he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. When our Lord rose from the dead, he made a pronouncement. He said, all authority is given unto me in heaven. And for years we stopped there in our eschatological scheme. He's got all authority in heaven, and he, re he reigns in denying the joy from heaven as dwelling place. While we muddle around down here, he's just kind of waiting in an ante room until some point in history when he'll start to do something down here. 
I don't know of anything that has paralyzed the purposes of God in the earth any more than the concept of the delayed activity and the bringing about of his kingdom in a time-space world. I believe that he has all authority in the earth now. He's not only the king of heaven, he's the king of earth. He's the king of Russia. He's the king of China. He's the king of the United States. He's the king of Canada. The king of Europe, Asia, Africa. He's the king of all the earth even now. I must confess that it is only in recent years I found David in the New Testament. I found Adam in there and I found Abraham. But I haven't found David. I mean, I haven't, haven't found David in the historical significance and in the eschatological significance that attaches to him. I haven't found him. That Jesus was of the seed of David, of course he was. He was in the Messianic line. And that was all it meant, until I saw that there was a historical significance in Jesus' relationship to Adam, for Paul says that Adam was a type of Christ. There was a historical relationship to Abraham, for it was Abraham's seed that was going to bless the nations of the earth. There was a historical significance in David because Jesus Christ was going to reign as God delegated king. And when he came into the world, he came into the world as the son of David. He came in as the king of the Jews. He came in as the king of all those that are redeemed, that under his authority, the redeemed community may become the means whereby he would establish God's sovereign right to reign in his own redeemed earth. Now, I'd like you to turn to Acts chapter 2. And I'm not going to start at verse 4. You know, the problem with Pentecostal people, and I use that in the broadest sense, is we turn to Acts 2, we invariably go to Acts 4 and build their three tabernacles. But Acts 2 has a whole lot of verses. And when we come to verse 29, there's much to proceed that it might be read. He talked about David. And in speaking of David, he has been speaking of David as David represented prophetically the Messiah. He says in verse 29, brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants upon his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. Now, it doesn't say he spoke of the second coming of Christ. Now, I, I, I'm not quibbling. I think there's a deep significance here that we've missed, and it's paralyzed us in the things that we have heard this week and which have been put before us as possibility. When I heard Ralph, and I'm not attempting to associate Ralph with any of my conclusions other than to say that when I heard Ralph talk about a counterculture and what is going on, my heart leaped within me until I could hardly keep my seat. For I believe that God is now in this hour bringing into focus something that has been distorted for many, many years. And that is that it is God's purpose not to redeem a bunch of people to sit at a bus stop and wait for them for a bus to come along and get them out of a mess. But God has redeemed them and cleaned them and put himself into them that he may send them back in to clean up the mess and be the salt of the earth and the light of the world and with the power of the gospel vindicate the death of God's own son. I believe the second coming of Christ is the hope of the believer. Christ is the hope of the believer. I don't believe it holds out any hope to the sinners. It is the sinner's judgment. It is the sinner's damnation. Therefore, if the sinner is to be helped, either individually or corporately, there is only one way that God is designed to help him, and that is by the power of the gospel. For the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And if it's the power, there's no dear power. And if Jesus Christ has all power in earth, there is no other power. He'll never have more power than he has now. If he's got it all, there ain't no more. He's got it now. 
and he is using that power in the gospel, not only individually, but he intends to use that power corporately, that in the redeemed community he may manifest the glory of God to the world. I believe the ultimate form of evangelism in this age of grace is going to be the manifestation of God's redeeming power through the total life of a redeemed community that manifests what the gospel can do in every area of human life individually and collectively. Verse 31, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was David. I am, I am stressing the fact that the Pentecostal effusion is related to David, brethren. I want you to hold that strongly in your mind now. Verse 34, For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucify. Now what came back from heaven? That which came back from heaven was the coronation oil that had been poured on the head of David's greater son, the new king. And as the Father crowned him, for we see him crowned with glory and honor, and as he ascended into the presence of the Father and sat upon his throne, he was anointed with a holy anointing oil of his kingship, and that oil came down on the day of Pentecost, and it covered and flooded and filled and possessed and impressed and drove and impelled men and women to become authorities for Jesus Christ as filled with the Holy Spirit. They went out to it challenge and to charm and to change the life of Jerusalem and the life of Judea and the life of Samaria and reach to the uttermost parts of the earth until the whole world knew that something had happened on the day of Pentecost. King Jesus had shared the anointing oil of his ultimate authority with the kingly community on the day of Pentecost. And I believe, brethren, that what is happening in this hour worldwide is unprecedented. This visitation of the Holy Spirit is not just to give us goosebumps and teach us to play tambourines and sing new choruses. That's all part of the package. But there's something much more important than all of that. This is God's almighty purpose being revealed that at the end of this age he's going to manifest his glory in the redeemed community. And this outpouring of the Holy Spirit is not only an outpouring of blessing, but it's an outpouring of authority. And he is establishing spiritual authority in the earth that he may in this hour bring into existence his kingdom in power and answer the prayers of multiplied thousands through the centuries who have interceded by saying, Thy kingdom come. When he ascended on high, he undertook the government of the universe. The Bible says the government was placed on his shoulder. If I ask you to turn, please, to Ephesians 4, as we talk about the order of God's government. We're still talking about his ascension in verse 8. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. How? By giving some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors or shepherds and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. I submit, brothers, that what is stated here is that when Christ arose and sat at the right hand of God, there was committed to him the absolute government of the earth and of the universe. And it was for him to determine what should be done to bring about the purposes of God. 
and he chose to do it by the sovereign appointment of apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers who would bring into existence a community of men and women, each of whom would know their place of service, who themselves would be uh, recreative and reproductive until there came a body of men and women in the earth who could be compared to a corporate mature man who would, be, who would resemble Christ in their corporeity, and what he was in his incarnate power and life, they would become in their corporate power and life. And he was going to do it by the use of chosen men. He was going to appoint them, he was going to anoint them, and he was going to equip them. How did, or how does God set these governmental authority, for I'm going to remain with the figure of kingdom. I'm saying that these men are men that God appoints to bring about the reign that is designed in the purpose of God for men. I think that we have a rather significant illustration of God's sovereignty in a choice. History tells us that Saul of Tarsus was a short, beetle-browed, bow-legged, hook-nosed little Jewish rabbi. We see this little man riding along on his donkey on the way to Damascus. And as he jogs along, the Bible says that he was breathing out threatenings and slaughters. He said, those crazy Christians, they're upsetting all of Judaism. I lay my hands on him and he feels in his pocket to be sure that he's got the letters from the high priest because he's on his way to Damascus to do a job of persecution. He's going to take those people into the synagogue and they're going to feel the lash. And if they die so much, the better. Get rid of a Christian and advance the cause of Judaism. That's the thing to do, these crazy Christians. And from his sovereign place on his throne, the Lord Jesus looks down and says, I'll take him. taken him, and I doubt if you would have taken it. But the point I want to make is that I think we need a revival of the concept of Christ's sovereign right to govern his kingdom. The kingdom of God is not a democracy, it's a theocracy. It's not run from the bottom up, it's run from the top down. Jesus Christ makes appointments. He appoints, and he anoints. On the day of Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit had come, there were all kinds of rumors going around about what was happening. You see, when you look at a divine happening, you've got a problem. You're either going to put a sense evaluation on it, or you're going to find out what the divine evaluation is. I'm sure that all of you, had you been devout Jews on the day of Pentecost, and had you gone in response to the noise that was coming from the temple, for when it says it was noise abroad, Dr. A.T. Robertson, the great Baptist Greek scholar who I don't think would be charged with being sympathetic to the charismatic thing, he says that the authority and meaning of that sentence is literally that there was so much noise coming from the temple that you could hear it all over town. There probably hadn't been that much noise ever before in the temple. And the people come running to see what the noise was. Some people say, I don't see any value in noise. Well, I tell you folks, you better reconcile yourself with noise. Because while silence has its place, the Bible's an awful noisy book. <laughs> and I'm glad the word noise is used. Had it said, make a joyful duet, <laughs> many of us would have been left out. But it says, make a joyful noise. Now, when you sing, that may be all it is. But the only qualification that is necessary is that it's joyful and it's unto the Lord. And they say we're noisy. Well, I want you to know that that's true, but I won't take the blame. 
I'm not to blame. Once more, God's the troublemaker. For the Bible says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And there came a sound from heaven. A sound. Brother, what we got here tonight is imported joy. It came from heaven. God started this racket on the day of Pentecost, and it's been going on ever since. Hallelujah. Somebody said, you don't have to make all that noise. God's not deaf. No one is not nervous either. <laughs> but I tell you, if you expect to be around when the Lord comes, you better get in order to noise. Because he's going to descend with a shout. Now, you think you shout, you ought to hear God shout. <laughs> and if this shouting isn't enough, he grabs a trumpet and lets out a blast. And the archangel lets out a blast. You know, Dr. Roland Bingham, the great Canadian missionary, thought for years that this whole thing was going to be very quiet. His wife came to him one day and she said, Dear, I have to speak to a, a ladies' group. And I, I have to speak about the coming of the Lord. And I've heard you say that it's going to be very silent and secret. And would you please give me a scripture for that? Oh, he said, I'd be glad to, dear. He said, you'll find it in First Thessalonians 4. She said, oh, thank you very much. But she went to come back a little later. She said, dear, I'm having problems with the scripture. She said, I always heard you say that it was going to be silent and quiet and secret. But she said, that's an awful noisy chapter. It says the Lord himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout. And with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. She said, I, I, I doubt if, if, if it's possible to, to, to keep that thing quiet. <laughs> now, these devout Jews, and had you been there, you probably would have looked at what was going on, and I wonder if you'd have made the same evaluation. They looked at what was going on, and what they saw disturbed them. They said, I never saw such indecency in the temple. I know it's only nine o'clock in the morning, but they must have got into the Sacramento wine. And they walked out of the temple and they said they're drunk. Isn't it amazing how you and I can be so clever? Look at something God is doing and give it a sense of evaluation. We can be so rigid in our religious Christianization that when God starts to shake us, we've got to find some kind of a rationale so that we won't be disturbed. And so they're drunk is good enough. Can you imagine people walking down the streets of Jerusalem pronouncing the visitation of the Holy Spirit on the historic day of Pentecost as drunkenness? There are men today that are looking at the things that God is doing and they are giving the same kind of sense evaluation. But there were other men who had the good sense to say and say, there's something here. We're singing a song these days. It's kind of a mystic song and some of you won't understand it. But you know that if you are spiritually alert and alive, you won't just hear words, you'll hear a sound. Words will have a sound. And we sing something and it goes like this. I hear a sound coming from the mountain. I hear it louder each day. I hear a sound. Coming from the mountain, it says, prepare ye the way, prepare ye the way, prepare ye the way, prepare ye the way of the Lord. I hear a sound. I hear words. I hear a sound. I saw a mass of men stand the night with their hands raised. I heard them praising God, but within that praise I heard a sound. 
I heard the rustling of robes. I smelt the aroma of heavenly breeze. I heard something within your voices, something that was not only born in your heart, but something that was transferred from heaven and mediated through your spirit until this auditorium was filled with a sound. And that sound was saying, man, get ready. There are great things up ahead. And there were those who heard a sound. And they said, what is it? And so Peter stood up with the eleven. In those days, the preachers stood together. And Peter said, These are not drunk, as ye suppose, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days will I pour out of my spirit, saith the Lord. And he went on, and he went on, and he preached a masterful address as he linked this thing with history. He linked it with the contemporary fact of Christ coming into a time-space world. He projected it into the future, and he said, The promise is to you and to your children, and unto all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And they were pricked in the heart and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> oh, I do now, Lord. He said, The key. The key. Key. Remember I told you about the key? Key. Oh, the key, yes. <laughs> Repent! And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, with a view to the remitting of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And the same day there were added to that redeemed community three thousand. Brother, he didn't ease them in. He didn't coax them in. He didn't coerce them in. He dynamited them in. <laughs> we are wondering why it is so hard to sell the charismatic thing to a non-charismatic Christian community. May I say very simply, and at the risk of losing my head, that if people were dynamited charismatically into a charismatic community, they'd have no problem understanding charismatic life. But when they're eased into it with all kinds of ecclesiastic and philosophical apologetics and come on, they don't know what it's all about until they find something happening over there. And then they're taken into a back room and it's suggested what may happen. Not Peter. He stood up, turned the keys, pulled the door open, and then they came. Hallelujah. These apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers then became, listen, I'm talking to you now in the context of kingdom, they became the governmental delegated authorities under King Jesus for the bringing into being of his kingdom, and they moved across the world and, quote, in every place, and, quote, they planted churches. A church is a manifestation of God's reign in a locality until the earth was covered with churches in every place. And Paul could say, as he wrote to the Corinthians, he addressed them and all who in every place call upon the name of the Lord. I've had two visions in my life. The last one was some 12 years ago in a convention in Canada. And in that convention, as I was sitting waiting to speak, I was in a secluded spot that I had chosen out in the sanctuary where I could hide behind a great pillar. And I had a kind of a little private office, and I had it arranged so that when the time came for me to speak, I could come up and speak. And I sat there, and I communed and felt the meeting. Suddenly, I felt to get on my knees. And as I got on my knees, I had a vision. And in the vision, I saw the earth as the astronaut pictured it from the moon. It was an orb out in space. And all over that orb were Quonset huts. Now, many of you are too young here to know what they are. But after the last war, they sold those aluminum warehouse-like structures called Quonset. How many know what a Quonset hut is? All right. I saw Quonset huts all over the globe, and they're all the same size. And I said, God, what's this? He said, I am going to have in every place a people that are known for the anointing. Now, at that time, I had a permanent charge, and I didn't know I was going to be traveling. 
And he said, And when you travel from place to place, you will not ask for my people by this name or that, but you will say, Where are the people of the anointing? If God is restoring in this hour the principles and purposes enunciated in the New Testament, then it is my firm belief that as his kingdom comes, we're going to see coming out of this renewal and this restoration that thing that God has intended. And in every communicable area, we're going to have a community of men and women that are flowing in the anointing. And that anointing is the kingly authority of our sovereign. And they're going to start to exercise rule. And they're going to take dominion over the power of Satan. They're going to bring princes down. The dark power that hovers over the parliament buildings of the nation are going to be paralyzed by the corporate prayer of an authoritative community. As the rod of his strength goes out of Zion, they'll change legislation. They'll chase the devil off the face of God's birth as they together, doing the will of God, will bring about God's purposes and God's reign in a kind space world. I want to say something here. It's kind of an interpolation. It belongs to the message, but it's just something God has quickened me recently. That if our Lord Jesus is the fulfillment of David, David had three anointings. David was anointed in Bethlehem as king over Israel. When Saul drove him into exile, he went to Ziklag, and there the vanguard of the coming nation under his rule came to him. When Saul died, David said, God, what do I do now and where do I go? And God said, go to Hebron. When he went to Hebron, they made him king over Judah, and they anointed him the second time. Seven and a half years later, when the house of Saul had lost all strength to resist, all Israel came to David in Hebron, and he was anointed the third time to be king over all Israel, and then they went to Zion. I believe if I may be permitted this interpretational opinion, that we are at present at Ziklag, and that we have an anointing for a Ziklag job, but I believe we're getting ready to go to Hebron. And I believe that there's a new wave of anointing going to come as our job gets bigger. There's an anointing coming of a new dimension. And then there's going to be another anointing of a greater dimension. So we don't sing we're marching to Ziklag. And we don't sing we're marching to Hebron. We're marching to Zion. I believe the anointing we've got right now is an anointing to get the first phase of the job done. I believe there's going to be a further dimension of anointing to get the next phase done. And I'm not saying what the phases are. And then there's going to be an ultimate anointing that is going to take us to Zion. And Zion is the ultimate place of God's glory. It's of Zion that you sing about when you sing Psalm 48. It's the joy of the whole earth. I conclude. Which usually doesn't mean anything, but I conclude. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to turn in conclusion to Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. I believe in apostles, I believe in prophets, I believe in evangelists, I believe in shepherds. And I'm going to say something that may sound shocking to you, but I believe that the coming of the kingdom may depend on shepherds more than any other of God's governmental men. I don't think there are that many apostles or prophets or evangelists for that matter. I think the great, permanent, stabilizing, governing community of man in the earth that carry on kingdom business are the shepherds. This is a shepherd point. I want to lay this on you shepherds. I think that you've been relegated to kind of a second place. You think of an apostle as somebody way up there, a prophet, an evangelist, you're just a shepherd. 
I believe that shepherds are the ongoing governmental authority. You're the ones in charge of the redeemed community. You're the ones that have got to keep it going in the nitty-gritty of everyday life. You're the ones that have got to develop it to maturity. You're important to God. You're more important than you know. And you've got to get rid of your false modesty and realize how important you are and rise up in the strength of your calling and take your divine anointing as shepherds and start to move with an authority that God God has given you in the place where he has put you to rule as his representative in love and concern and compassion and bring the sheep into a community of power and compassion and concern that will attract the world to an alternate society and a counterculture and a way of life that they're looking for. They've run out of options. They're fled there. They're worn out. They've got nothing left. Their economy's on the rocks. Their politics are all torn up. Their societies are shambles. The world has no options. Left. We're the world's last hope. They're looking this way. Is there a people that has got it together? Is there a man that doesn't need a psychiatrist? Is there a couple that don't need marriage counselors? Is there a family that can get it together? Is there a community of men and women that can interrelate in joy and peace and hope? Where is it? Give it to us. The world has its disunited notions of the United Nations. We don't need it. We need the united body of God's people. I composed the chorus for this invention. I'm going to have the audacity to sing it for you. Can I have a little water for my melodious voice? Thank you. This chorus was born in Kansas City before I ever knew there was going to be a separate song. Then the shepherds get together and the sheep get together, then the whole world will know. When the shepherds get together and the sheep get together, then the whole world will know. When every Christian takes his place, pays his love get to the race, and the glory of the Lord is seen on every face. When the shepherds get together and the sheep get together in the whole world, the whole world, the whole world, the whole world will know. God's kingdom, I believe is upon us. I believe this visitation is for the purpose of bringing us into spiritual authority. And without any singing, without the use of any music, I'm going to ask this tonight, I'm going to ask the speakers that have been here to come to Frank one, and I'm going to ask this just to start to move around among one another as shepherds. I want you to embrace one another. I want you to bless one another. I want you to impart spiritual graces to one another in the mystery of the community of the Holy Spirit. I want you to find one another. I want you to encourage one another as you go back to wherever you're going. I want you to go home with a new sense of authority and, and dignity and purpose. I want you to know that it is the purpose of the King who has all authority in heaven and in earth to mediate his authority through you in the place where you are and that as you pray and wait on God, God is going to make you mighty in the place of his appointment for you. So we stand. Will the speakers come to the platform? I'm going to pray. When I'm through praying, I want you to rush for the exit. I want you to rush for one another. And I want you to find one another in a community of love and concern. Maybe you don't know the fellow that's in here. That, is, that, that really doesn't matter. All right? Hold our heart. Praise the Father. We thank you for these days together. We thank you for the visitation of your presence. We thank you for the insights of your word. And we pray, our Father, that the challenge of these days will inspire our hearts to stand tall, to recognize that we are your delegates in the kingdom on the earth, that we can turn to a world that is threadbare and run out of options, 
and we can offer them not just a word or a book or a fact, but we can offer them a way of life in our corporate relationships that will make them know that it's possible for man to live righteously with one another in this time space world. Hallelujah. 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 Now, just before you do what I've asked you to do, just before you find one another as a closing exercise of love, embracing one another and blessing one another. Look, I don't believe that when I put my hands on you that that has no meaning. I don't understand it all, but I believe that if I put my arms around you, I'm going to leave a deposit of love and joy in your life. Do you believe that? God has given us the joy of distributing his blessings. You know a marvelous thing? I want us to lift our covenant hand. Every nation raises one hand in a salute. It keeps the other one for fighting. But in the Christian community, the war is over. Jesus made peace by the blood of his cross. So we put them both up. Now let's declare three times in a loud voice until Kansas City hears it. Jesus Christ is Lord. Are you ready? Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. This concludes the message by Ern Baxter.